Hello. So um, we released LexD 4.11 yesterday and it's gonna be rolling out to, to users uh, starting Monday, most likely uh, for, for those using the snap package. There are also native packages in a number of other distros that are in various state at this point. And the uh, CLI client for Windows and Mac OS is already on, uh, on 4.11. So I'm just gonna be going through the, the different new, new features in this release. Um, the f it's, it's quite an exciting release. We've added quite a few new things, including a new, few new device types. So the, the main new features are a API to do bulk instance uh, state change on the server side so that the client tool doesn't need to fetch all of the instances and apply the new state. We've got GVRP support for uh, dynamic VLAN configuration, server side instance uh, storage pool migration so that a uh, an instance can be moved from one storage pool to another uh, quite a bit easier than in the past. A new volume usage API uh, for, for state usage on, on, on volumes. We've got SRIOV support for GPUs on virtual machines. We've got uh, some tweaks around ISO images being attached to virtual machines and uh, a new um, PCI device type as well that was added. And lastly, uh, some tweaks to the uh, CLI tooling to, to export the older messages in more different formats. So that's, that's quite a busy release. Um, it will take a little bit of time to go through all of those. So the first one is um, the feature to do bulk restarts. So as we can see here, I'm running a, a bunch of different containers and virtual machines on this machine. Um, I can do restart dash dash all. And that would take whatever time it takes for all of those uh, to shut down cleanly and then get restarted. Um, and there we go. So that was already there. Um, the dash dash all thing has been around for a long time, but how it does it is what changed with this release. Um, in the past, it would go and fetch all of the instances, look at their status, and then issue individual uh, API calls for every one of them to change state. Doesn't do that anymore. Um, we can probably see that actually if we do um, a dash dash all dash dash debug, um, actually just waiting for waiting a few more seconds for the virtual machine to be back online so that it can actually restart properly. Otherwise, when you send that event, it will just kind of ignore it because there's no init system yet to deal with it. That should be fine now. So let's just do it again with debug. All right. And if we go back up a tiny bit here, you should see, there you go. So there's an API call that was made. Come on, highlight, there we go. API call that was made for put on slash 1.0 slash instances. So that's at the endpoint that represents all the instances in one shot. And what was pushed to that is action restart, um, no timeout, no need to forcefully do anything and no uh, stateful snapshotting. Um, getting a bit of a getting a YouTube warning around uh, stream latency. I'm just hoping that things are back online. Okay, it says people will be uh, getting some buffering. Okay, fine. So it still seems to be getting stuff. Uh, I think my CPU usage just went to the roof with that uh, mass restart, but should be okay now. Um, so, yeah, the single API call and next day did the, the bulk refresh in parallel on its side. And that's a pretty nice improvement, especially for anyone scripting next day. It also means a lot less latency and network connections from the client because instead of having to do potentially, you know, 20, 30, 50 different API calls all in parallel and track them all, and it just does one and next day does it internally. Uh, and next day also knows about clustering and can, can do a pretty good job at spreading that stuff. Now, the um, the next feature is around um, GVRP. For that, I needed some systems to be deployed. Let me just see if they, they have deployed now. Yep. Okay, so let's get that going. Um, just gonna get two terminals here. So I deployed two new systems. Just go on to them. There we go. Now I need to get uh, 
latest candidate. So let's the run the proper next release. Here we go. Oh, there's a well, well that's going on there's a question around uh, having some way of filtering the mass restarts uh, currently there isn't the cli also never had uh, that kind of filtering ability that being said there is uh, support for um, for filtering of collections in our rest api on some endpoints so it should be possible to add to combine both abilities in, in the future so that you can actually say okay you need only those that have that configuration key set, only those of that type, I want to, to restart them. Um, but yeah, not currently. So, okay, so both of them are running for 11. Uh, I don't really care about how they're configured all that much. So I'm just going to run auto mode on both of them. Come on. Okay. Uh, then we'll just run an Ubuntu 2004 container on each. And both of those systems are connected to the same uh, physical switch. So that's why we can actually make use of GVRP. Right now, you want to just, yeah. So both of them are running. They both have local IPs. What I'll do now is just look at the physical network config here. So, okay, EN01 here is the main neck. Same thing here. Uh, oh, and there's actually a physical bridge. So that's even more convenient. Um, so I believe I should be able to do let's see, config device add e1. We'll add it as eth1. It's a neck. We want it bridged directly into um, br0 was the name. Uh, call it eth1 inside. The we we'll say we want to be done 2000 and uh, gvrp enabled. Okay, so that's not hard. I believe that worked on bridged type devices. Huh. Uh, maybe not. So let's just try that instead. Okay, so it works fine with MacBinan. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, oh yeah, I believe it's on MacVillan, IPVLAN, physical. And that's probably it. Uh, this the actual list of uh, supported options is on, in the release notes. I don't have them open right now, so I was just making the wrong assumption. So, okay, Mac VLAN, the parent is in one, name is which one, VLAN 2000, GVRP, true. Oh, the instance is U2 on this one. Let's do that. Okay. Now let's get a shell in both of those. And. Uh, Bring up ETH one on both. Okay. Then uh, the ETH one. Uh, I oops. IP adder and there we go. And we'll do the same thing on the other side. And this is not working. Now, uh, let's see why that might be. Because I'm pretty sure we had this stuff working. Uh, is MacVillan messing with me somehow? Uh, I'm gonna have to read a documentation, I think, at this rate. Um, it might be that MacVillan is actually causing some issues here. Just read through because we've added uh, the GVRP support on a number of things. So yeah, MacVillan supports it. Physical supports it. Mm -hmm. um, but in this case, we can't deal with physical uh, because the, the physical nick is used by something else. Okay, so MacVillan or physical, and what's in the instance config itself? MacVillan physical. Okay. Yeah. 
yeah, that's interesting. Um, let's just see if there's anything else going on. So that's the switch that all that stuff is connected to. Um, you just look up what the ports are. So we're looking at NUG0 and NUG02, so it's port 5 or 6. 5, 6 is configured to learn from GVRP. So this is suggesting that the, the Mac VLAN device is somehow not written properly. I'm just gonna check that there's nothing wonky with the device. It's going through ETH1. Uh, ETH1 is properly up, so there's no issue there. Um, let's just try to bounce it. See. So just want to recheck that the config is correct. So your VLAN 2000 GVRP is true on ETH1. Okay, so that's normally, I would expect that to notify the switch. Oh, this time it did. There we go, GVRP 2000 dynamic. Okay, uh, let's see. What's the membership info on this one? Okay, port six is good. Uh, so I think it was the, um, the hot plug that caused some confusion. Let's just bounce both of them. Okay, how about you see the other one now? <laughs> okay, uh, let's just try. So I'm gonna have to bring the interface up. Uh, the address, oops, that's the wrong one. Where is it? This one. Uh, so that won't work yet because the receiving side is not actually up. So we just did the same thing here, bring the interface up. And the address. And now the VLAN is not found at all. Okay. So there's something wonky going on with uh, with GVRP in this particular setup. That's interesting. I swear we got it working in uh, doing development, but it looks like it's probably the Mac VLAN that's causing issues um, because the Mac VLAN is bridged. Well, there's a bridge on top of Mac VLAN, which is probably causing some difficulties here. Um, let's see. What can I? I think the easiest way is going to be to get rid of the bridge. Um, so I should just need to move. That's slightly more involved than I was expecting to do for this demo. <laughs> but uh, so that should work. Match MTU, whatever. Okay, so let's remove the MTU. No need to bridge interfaces. Keep all of the IP addresses and whatnot in place. Um, well, that definitely doesn't apply anymore. Let's just see if the config validates. Yeah, it does. Okay, fine. Let's reboot it. And do the same thing on this one. Okay, let's move that up. Let's get rid of this. Uh, get rid of those. Get rid of that. Actually, set name can stay. Yeah, okay. MTU is duplicated. Um, does that apply? Yeah, okay. Let's try reboot. Okay, NUC is back up, which now doesn't have a bridge anymore. So that might make things a bit more reliable. In general, it's not a good idea to try and, um, and bridge on top of a device that's used for Mac VLAN. So that's why I'm hoping that's the issue um, that's causing some difference from last time we attempted that. Okay, so now let's see the switch. Okay, let's go to dynamic VLAN up with the first NUC right now. So just waiting for the second one to please come back to life. Okay, it's getting there. Okay. The instance is not up yet. That machine is still booting back up. Okay, now it's running. Five and six, yay! Okay, so that was the issue. The, the Mac VLAN was definitely the problem. Uh, getting rid of it is fixing that particular issue. Um, like the, the problem, well, bridging on top of Mac VLAN, you end up with a lot of different Mac addresses, and that just confuses the highlight of the switch. Um, 
So we want set up, add the address and start pinging. And same thing on this side, bring the link up, add the address. Yay, and this finally works. So yeah, don't mix <laughs> MacVillan and bridging. Uh, if you just do straight MacVillan or apply it directly to physical neck, GVRP works. Um, the VLAN is just defined in those two systems that automatically announced it to the switch. Uh, the switch shows it as running and everything's good. Um, note that not all of the switch support that. Actually, this one we normally don't have GVRP enabled, but I just enabled it for the demo. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it back off, which will make that VLAN disappear now. There we go. Uh, and similarly, ping is no longer working because the VLAN just went away. So, but if, you're, if you've got a lab environment with switches supporting GVRP, uh, that can be quite useful to quickly create uh, extra network connections using VLAN and not have to go and reconfigure your switch and your ports every time. Alrighty. So that was the second feature that got added. The, the third feature is in the same vein as the uh, bulk instance um, change update it's uh, around storage pools and moving instances um, so right now i don't have other storage pools i'm just going to create one so just a plain directory one uh, let's launch a simple alpine container okay that instance is going to be on the first pool uh, we can list the volumes say on the new one and we see that there's nothing and now if I stop that instance, I'm able to move it with um, storage. And then I just point to where I want it to go, which is the directory storage pool. And if I list, it's there. That was already possible before, but uh, we were effectively doing it by telling LexD to create a copy of the instance and then sending a separate query to delete it, which can mess with some of the volatile keys and configuration options. Um, this is now all done server side. So we can see if I move it back on my, to my default pool and I do the debug, um, we can see the actual post data up here. So we see post to 1.0 instances A, A1 and we see that the target pool is now being pushed to the server, then the server does the needed data reshuffling database update and then returns once the instance has been moved. Okay, it's cleaning things up, there we go. Next up is the volume usage API. So that one is completely new, we didn't have that before. Um, you can now do, if you list the, the volumes, you can do volume info on the storage pool and say we want info on I don't know, container steam. And now it tells us the amount used in bytes. Um, that was technically possible to query through um, LXC info on the container itself. So, you, but that would only show if it's running and that would show, um, actually let me do it on something that's running. So if I do this one, uh, we can see it here, disk usage for root. That was that worked fine and you could put it, but the thing needed to be running. Um, and it, you would only be able to get the disk usage of a custom volume if it was attached to something. So now we've got an ability to directly get it on, from anything. So like I can do custom images and get that, even though it's not attached to anything. And probably in a more, lot more useful manner. Um, so if you do a normal list, we've now added support for columns. So you can do just say type name content type. And quite a bit more useful, you've got capital U now, which is disk usage. And that gets you the disk usage of every single volume that we can pull a disk usage from. Um, it can't do it for snapshots so i just added a snapshot now and we can see snapshot doesn't report it uh, we might add that later on but calculating actual disk usage on snapshots is very tricky on some of the storage backends so for now we've not done that um, and just like we also don't report it on images we we could do it for images um, but they are completely redone completely fixed and you already have the size info like readily available here 
um, so that might get added down the line. But right now, we, we didn't have the internal APIs to do images, so we are just doing instances and custom volumes. Now, another, like the next two ones are kind of uh, tricky in the sense that most users just won't have the, the hardware for that. Um, but let's connect to one of our development systems. Uh, oops, I can't type today. There we go. So, this particular system, um, well, first of all, what version is it running? Just to kind of make sure it's on 4.11. Yay. So it's running a number of virtual machines uh, in containers right now. The thing that it has that's a bit, that's very unique is it's got support for SRIOV GPUs. So that system has an S7150 card from AMD, which is a dual GPU card uh, with each GPU supporting a variety of um, virtual functions. So if we go down into the resources API, if we can see here, uh, CPU card zero, AMD, so we see it's a Fire Pro S7150. It supports a maximum of 16 virtual functions, all of which are enabled. So we see them down here, uh, 16 virtual GPUs. And then it shows us a second card, but it's technically a second GPU die on the same card, uh, which is another 16. Then that system also supports SRIOV um, on network cards. So we see one here, it's, um, it's an Intel X7, uh, yeah, X722 uh, gigabit card that supports 32 functions and those are also enabled. That lets us do something like this. So if we look at the expanded config of, uh, let's do V1. This is a virtual machine and it's using, um, so it's using a configured managed network called dev. If we go look at that particular network, we see that dev is of SIOV type and its parent is that uh, X722 card I showed earlier. And it's using SIOV. So that means that any virtual machine or, or container that uses that network will automatically get a virtual function from that network card instead of a virtual network card. Now, we have also added um, two GPUs here. We can see that here. So they're both SIOV type with the parent card being listed. So we see it's um, the card at address 23 and 26. If we go back to the resources API, the um, that first one is address 20, is here at address 23. The second card's address 26. And we just say SIOV and then next D takes care of figuring out the, um, the right device, or the right virtual function that can be used for that. So I'm just gonna turn it, off, turn it off and then turn it back on to show that this, work, this works properly. I'll just give it a few seconds um, once that's done. So SIOV can take a little while to allocate because we need to look up all of the functions on network and the two GPUs, figure out which one might be unused in there and then um, disconnect it from the host, set it uh, through VFI or PCI and pass that into the uh, virtual machine. So that VM is starting up now. I, maybe it's already got a shell. Maybe I'm optimistic. Yeah, I'm a bit optimistic. Let's give it a few more seconds. There we go. Uh, and I've got the SPCI installed in it. So if we dump the, the PCI devices, we're gonna see that our Ethernet controller is an Intel Corporation virtual function, 700 series. It is not the usual Vertio net network device that you get inside uh, of virtual machines on next day. And you can also see we've got an additional two devices here that are AMD GPUs. So it just, it doesn't tell you exactly what it is. Well, actually it does, Fire Pro S7150V, um, which is the virtual function of the 7150. And you could then load the AMD GPU Pro driver in there and use those for compute. Uh, to be clear, SRIOV GPUs are very uncommon right now. Uh, and the few that have them, you need some very weird uh, kernel driver to run on the host to support them. Uh, the one that we're using here is called MX GPU and that's like the loaded of GitHub. Um, so it's, it's a bit, uh, <laughs> It feels a bit experimental. Um, and then inside the VM, you get the GPUs, but obviously you can't 
really do, there's no VGA output or any kind of output on those virtual GPUs. So you can use them for compute, you can use them for rendering and encoding type workloads, but you can't actually get a desktop on that. Okay, uh, that gets us onto the next feature, which is the raw PCI pass-through. And I think I've got one VM that's already configured um, for back from when I was adding that feature. So it's that test VM, I think. Yeah. So we see it once again connected directly um, to that dev network for various IOV for the network card. Um, I've then disabled the two GPUs that are in my default profile. And what I've added on top is uh, straight up PCI pass-through. So in this case, um, I'm doing pass-through of whatever is, I don't actually remember what are those addresses. Let's go look, uh, 2603.7. So that's, a, that's one of the virtual functions on the MD GPU, on the secondary MD GPU, I believe, based on the address. Um, and then this one would be an Intel network card. So you can point that to any valid PCI address uh, that is not actively in use by the host, so long as your motherboard and OS are configured to properly do IOMMU that gets passed into the virtual machine. So we can go inside it. Uh, and just to be annoying, we don't have PCI utils. PCI. Okay, let's just install that quickly. So now listing, um, listing the devices, we can, we can see the first, so the first Ethernet device here is at address five, which is the normal address for, for NXD network cards. Uh, so that's, that's the one that's configured the normal way uh, by using a network device that's connected also to SIOV. Then the follow-up two devices here, so that VGA and that Ethernet, those are using the, the PCI pass-through option that I showed. They, they just were passed through, passed straight through to the VM. And so that's the new PCI pass through. The reason why you might want to use that device type, uh, obviously it doesn't make much sense in what I showed you here because we've got GPU SIOV pass through and we've got a network card SIOV pass through. So you would normally use that instead. Uh, you can use the PCI pass through if you want to pass something like a storage card or if you want to pass I don't know, a USB controller or an FPGA card or anything else that XD doesn't support. Anything that's on the PCI bus, you can pass into your VM through that. Okay, next one is gonna be potentially slightly exciting. I'm hoping my laptop won't melt doing that. Uh, so I've been downloading an ISO image. Uh, you should see it here, yeah, Win 10. So that's uh, Windows 10 ISO image. We've added a, a new feature in Distro Builder uh, over the past few weeks. Um, so if you're in Distro Builder, it's gonna want me to run it as root, so just, let's do that already. Um, so Distro Builder and there's a repack Windows flag, which takes a path to an ISO image for Windows and takes another path to a target ISO. What it does is it unpacks that ISO image. It then downloads the latest Vertigo drivers for you and will inject those into the, um, the Windows ISO and speed out a new ISO uh, that you can use with FlexD. This, yeah, this makes it very easy to install Windows. Uh, in the past, you had to, to use rad.qemu to pass a bunch of extra devices and, and other other weirdness. Um, this is no longer needed, thanks to that. Um, it takes a little while. It can be faster on some other systems. My my laptop is using um, is using ZFS, and because of overly FS and ZFS are incompatible, the entire ISO image actually needs to be unpacked. And unfortunately, ISO images from Microsoft are not exactly small. Uh, let's see what that one looks like. But yeah, it's 5.8 gigs large. So that takes a little while to, to unpack. Um, once that's fully unpacked, then the driver can be inserted and the ISO is then regenerated uh, at the target ISO. So that's what we're seeing now. Now it's finally finished unpacking it and it's uh, injecting the drivers one by one in there. So that involves copying a bunch of files, editing some uh, Windows registry high files uh, to, to load them. 
that's needed because we, we actually need the installer image itself to have those drivers built in so that it can reach the hard drive, well, in this case, the CD-ROM drive to, to pull the rest of the data. Um, this takes uh, quite a little while to, to actually do for every one of the drivers, is what we're seeing here. Uh, the drivers we're injecting are effectively everything that LexD needs. Uh, so the primary one, and that's what's got injected into the boot file here, is the Vertio SCSI driver, so that the drive itself can be accessed at all. Uh, then we're also in injecting things like the Vertio network driver, the Vertio input driver, um, random number generator, serial driver, pretty much anything that LexD uses. The end result is that when you install LexD using that ISO image, you get all the drivers already present at the end of the install, except for two devices. Uh, so we're currently missing a Vertio VGA driver and a Vertio VSOC driver. Both of those are currently in development by the uh, the team behind the Vertio Windows drivers, uh, but they're not present yet. So those two devices remain as, um, as effectively not having a driver and, and showing up as like misconfigured in Windows. couple of things on my laptop to make it go slightly faster. That would be nice. I think I'm pretty much running out of memory at this point doing this stuff, um, especially with the live stream. Like it's not really struggling too much to do that usually, uh, but the combination of, uh, of live stream, having a bunch of uh, web browsers open and the, uh, the repacking is definitely quite taxing. Just let's see how much is my memory looking like. Okay, so since I've got free memory, so I'm not gonna run out, but I guess my CPU is probably a bit toasty right now. Yeah, yeah, quite toasty. <laughs> a um, bunch of it being used by OBS to, to handle the stream. Um, from what I remember, we only have like six or seven drivers there about, so we should be pretty much at the end of the, the actual um, insertion of those drivers. Maybe while that's going on, uh, I can show the next feature. And the next feature is in the, the command line. So we've got a hidden command. Like for, for those of you who don't know that, um, if you do LXC help, you get a list of commands. You don't get all of them. Um, you can do a dash dash all, which is listed at the bottom, which then adds a number of more, more commands. That includes things like pause, and in this case, it includes uh, the man page command. So LXC man page lets you as the name implies, generate man pages. So I can create a directory called man, and I can just be I dump them in there. And now I've got man pages for all of the sub commands directly generated into the directory. What has changed now is that we've got additional formats. The one we're the most likely to use, uh, especially for our website, is the markdown format. So we can run this. And now we've got markdown for the commands. So say we go look at, I don't know, LXC list, we get that nice markdown with the, the synopsis and commands and everything. It's all nicely structured. And it supports more, more formats than just that. Uh, so you can do uh, restricted, restricted text, um, which then looks like this. I didn't show you the content of the man pages. That's because it's a man page file, which is not really something that most humans can read without actually using the man tool. Um, and the last one, I believe, is YAML. I've never actually looked at the YAML one. I'm not sure what that's going to look like. OK, so that's, that's pretty nice and structured. So it shows the name, the synopsis, the uh, description, and then usage with um, each of the flags and their default value. So. Yeah, it makes it very, very convenient to um, to inspect what we what we support in the LexD command line, uh, and we will definitely use that for our website to to easily show that to um, to our users, so they can they can Google around for whatever command they want, and they will actually land on a page that shows them the uh, the usage for that command. And let's see what's going on with Windows. Okay, so as it turns out, we actually have a few more drivers than I remembered. We've got eleven. Uh, so the ISO is now being regenerated. Let's see if it's 
directly writing it to that directory or if it's writing it somewhere temporarily. Okay, so that's the new ISO. Uh, it's actually already the right size. I don't know if it's because it's almost done or if it's just because of the way it allocates things. Okay, it's done. So we see it's a bit larger. It went from uh, 5.8 gigs to 6.1 gigs. That's because of all the drivers we've added in there. And now, now we've got that in place. Um, what you can do is create a new instance. Let's call it win. Um, not creating it from an image, so it's empty. And it's a virtual machine. Then we need to go and do a device override on its root device to bump its size to something quite a bit bigger. Otherwise, Windows really doesn't like you. Uh, config device override, please. If I put the instance name, it's gonna work better. There we go. Um, and lastly, let's just be slightly nicer with memory. So four gigs, I think I can afford that on my machine right now. And let's be optimistic and give it two CPUs. I don't want to give it any more than that. So we're gonna have problems with the stream. Um, that should be okay. Oh, Windows also doesn't like secure boot. I keep forgetting that. So uh, security, secure boot, false. All right, so that should be all we need to set. So just bumping the, the size a bit and disabling secure boot. Then what we do is device add. So we just call it um, ISO, or we're gonna call it install. Let's do that. Disk and the source is home, downloads, win 10 ISO. Okay. Oh, actually I forgot to do something. Uh, let me just remove that one. We want it to boot automatically from it, so we just need to boot priority and just do 10. Okay, now starting this with VG output. Oops, uh, it's console. Okay, so that should get me a graphical console thing. And let's see if OBS will let me share that easily. Yep, there we go. So press any key, I'm doing that. And we see the, the Windows loading animation there as it's booting. Uh, I won't actually go through an entire install. That takes forever, even more uh, as, as I'm doing on stream with my CPU being, <laughs> being pegged. Um, but let's just do install now. I just want to show that the, the drive is properly detected and that it's ready for an install because that's the main difference. Like we, we really had to jump through hoops in the past for that, it's significantly better now. Okay. Uh, so there's a question around um, VM images uh, like um, OVA or QCAR. So LXD uses um, uncompressed raw images for its uh, virtual machines. The reason being that we unpack on things like Ceph and ZFS and others that, that don't necessarily support it. Um, but you can definitely, you can easily convert the QMU image tool lets you easily convert between, um, any format. So you can convert to raw and then dubbing that into LXD, um, attaching it, like you, you can attach it to an existing instance directly and just boot from it if you want. Um, or you could, uh, use the migration API to load that directly into LXD as its main disk, or you can actually, um, pack it into, um, uh, like having a metadata table and that file alongside it, and then you can you can load that into LXD as an image. Actually, if you do that, then LXD takes QCAR through. So if you've got an existing image that you just want to import into LXD as an image, you can create a metadata table that just adds a YAML file that defines kind of what your image is. And then you can use LXD image import, passing both that table and your uh, QCAR2 image and LXD will import that into its image store. So it will store it as compressed QCAR2, but it will unpack it uh, as raw image uh, into the storage pools to, to create the instances from. All right, so that's the main thing I wanted to show. The drive is detected, we see our 50 gigs and we can actually install from onto it. So if I go next, it's gonna start copying stuff, at which point I will go and kill that virtual machine because I don't actually want it to install and use all my CPU, but Let's just switch back and uh, just do let's see stop when false. By the way, uh, apparently ST 
see the half that window open somewhere. Anyway, um, there we go. So that's that window is being significantly easier to install now. You can just use the tree builder to repack the image, then just feed it straight to uh, to LXD, and it will work as expected. It's also worth noting that the same tool works with uh, Windows Server images. We've done less testing with those than with uh, the basic Windows 10 image you get from Microsoft, uh, but it does detect Windows Server and will unpack the right driver for those as well. And that's it for the new features in LexD 411. So again, uh, we're gonna have that uh, available to our st stable users through the snap uh, on Monday. Right now it's in the candidate channel if you want to play with it ahead of time. If you find any issue, uh, please mention them either on the on the forum or on GitHub so we can fix them. And yeah, enjoy, enjoy LexD 411 and I'll catch you on the uh, next stream. I've, We've been kind of busy lately, so we've not been able to do much other content than those than those release updates. Uh, but hopefully, um, that will change in in the future as we we get a bit more time. Thanks.